This is Faye Monk, your Prairie Monk, WEFT Champagne, 90.1 on your FM dial. And Dave on the board. And uh, I apologize for, for the face. I just fell over outside. But uh, got a lot to say. Uh, last night, after I returned from a Maytag conference, I, I was privileged to visit with Jill and Tony at Cisco for a pleasant discussion on Prairie and uh, prairie preservation and local prairies, and uh, they have a wonderful house uh, built with uh, beams, uh, I think from a barn, but might not have been from a barn, but it's of the era where you put things together with pegs, and you could see that the angles, uh, supports were uh, uh, axed according to the grain rather than according to uh, a straight line. So uh, that gives strength and permanency. <laughs> and so Jill cooked a nice meal for us and uh, we talked about all sorts of things. They have a prairie. They uh, have a, a Department of Natural Resources prairie, which is mainly grasses but with a, just a, a sprinkling of broad leaves. So it's a, a, a very uh, attractive prairie after about five years. And uh, it does all the things that a grass prairie does. But Ron Slater, uh, who knows Jill and Tony, uh, is trying to encourage uh, some broader spectrum of diversity in the uh, prairie. And uh, uh, he has seed uh, that he Jill had come to the Rantoul Pope Prairie and picked seed there, and so Ron had that, and uh, we'll discuss a little bit of what might be done with that. Uh, there, uh, little prairie has gone into its fall, and so I'd, as I drove around the drive, there's uh, the... Uh, Plants are doing just like they need to do, and but this could be a little more diverse. Uh, uh, Carl Handel was the one that put the prairie in and provided the seed, and uh, the Handel family. I, I assume they're uh, uh, the same people. Uh, uh, provide information and what to do with the prairie in the future. And they have been burning it. It has a, enough fuel matrix. Uh, we talked about nearby prairies uh, that uh, are administrated sometimes by Allerton Park, sometimes by uh, private people, and sometimes by, with our own Heartland Pathways Prairie. Uh, We talked about drainage and uh, how drainage moves across your property. Uh, uh, we, uh, I had a box full of books that I'd brought at the Maytag tag conference or after it, and we talked about that. And uh, uh, we have a, a pocket prairie CD, and I took that so uh, Jill could show Tony. Uh, what we have is a pocket prairie, and it's being used and visited. Uh, it, it is also a, an attractive nuisance, so uh, people tend to sleep out there sometimes, uh, so I have to surveil that. It's been a very useful prairie uh, to let people know what a prairie forest ecosystem is like uh, without having to go 20 miles to find one. And we constantly have a, a group of people who are prairie oriented, uh, and then just people who are surprised to find a pocket prairie downtown with a lot of ambiance and, and something that is interesting. Uh, I'll say something about that later because one of our keynote speakers was talking about 
these sorts of things. Uh, Ron was talking about a raised bed for uh, broad leaves because in the first place you have a rabbit problem and in the second place you need a very deep uh, place for roots uh, and uh, and you need to, to have a, a site that is insulated enough that it uh, doesn't freeze in winter and prairie plants have deep deep roots and they they uh, slow grow as uh, as far as gratification is concerned because the roots grow first and the tops grow later uh, we were also uh, evil minded enough to wonder if Jill and Ta uh, Tony could be uh, interested in the, the potential nature trail which we have on Heartland Pathways, the abandoned railroad bed which runs adjacent to Hallerton Park and we really need people who are nearby to, to check out that uh, area and, and perhaps to help us remove invasive weed trees like autumn olives that grow very well and seed very well and take over the prairie and shade it out. Uh, we talked about mowing. The area between Monticello and Cisco, we had thought we had a, a no-mow policy on it, but in by August the 1st, it was mown, and it was mown twice with a, two different directions with a 15-foot brush hog, and that really took out a lot of prairie. Uh, if we go to Iowa, there are roadside prairies everywhere, and uh, it's so different and uh, so unnecessary and, and so expensive. So uh, we, we talked about the rural sociology uh, of the communities on rail trails. Often the r rail trail is re is on a highway that's been replaced. So if you look at I-72, it replaced the highway on all 47. The highway between Champaign and Clinton is r basically Route 10, and the, uh, the railbed parallels that. Uh, we've had some difficulty there with people digging up the prairie, so we... Uh, immediately lose all the bacteria and the originality of the soil and that's somewhat cruel so when I w go to a trail conference I'm looking for things that help us to uh, avoid that sort of thing. Uh, the bikeways are interesting. This was a trail conference so it was basically bikes and hiking and water trails um, like Des Moines where we went uh, has a, a water trail and it has a, a trail along the river bank in the city and there was a field trip to the uh, the state capital and uh, sculpted areas around and, and river trails and things like that. I walked into uh, the city building and it was uh, a historic monster and of, it was a huge ceiling and uh, it rolled back to a different era uh, that Route 74 towards St. Joe and Danville parallels 150 which was the only highway at one stage so we, we do have a, a potential rail trail there that uh, w allows people to communicate with little villages uh, along the way, big villages in the case of St. Joe. And uh, uh, this, we've lost a little bit of that corridor to road widening, but we still have the potential for a prairie trail along Route 150 if we can uh, reduce the amount of mowing from 15 feet to 5 feet and on the downslope only and not on the upslope. Uh, we've lost quite a bit of prairie, original prairie soil there, but some of it has gone to uh, the Forest Preserve, which is in charge of this Champagne 
uh, part of the Kickapoo Trail. The Vermilion County Conservation District is in charge of a big bridge and a, another portion of that trail. Uh, so this Thursday, uh, the Forest Preserve held a uh, informational meeting at St. Joe, but it's also where you listen to who uh, needs to do what with the trail, and, and uh, it's very important to have uh, community input and uh, community volunteerism. This is a big enough thing that you need state support, you need uh, governor support, you need uh, local volunteers uh, to look after the trail and take it into public ownership. Uh, but some of the sorts of things that would be of interest in that meeting are Farm Bureau interests in uh, the uh, uh, land b returning to farmland. So it's not always easy and sometimes there has been invasion and that takes a lot of legal uh, and long time involvement to straighten out invasion of that nature. Uh, uh, there are special features like uh, at Fithian we have an interurban uh, building which is uh, really a nice feature on the trail. And so we start to look at 10 miles on each side of the trail um, and that includes the, the Lincoln legal trail when uh, Abe Lincoln was traveling the circuit uh, in this area. Uh, there's Kickapoo uh, State Park and the uh, Conservation District Parkland. Uh, but so uh, as I was going to Iowa, I was uh, interested in Route 80, because Route 80 was paralleled by Route 6, and all those little towns have their history. And one of the places I stopped at was at Colfax, and uh, there was a history of uh, mineral water, and before that, coal mining. So you, when you think of coal mining, you often have to think about plate te tectonics and blocked drainage which allowed the growth of vegetation which eventually got compacted and became coal. Uh, and associated with that is mineral water. And so uh, I'll come back to that later because I stayed over a day and, and went to some of these little places. There was coal facts with mineral water and coal mining and uh, historic museum and that uh, often those little historic museums have trouble surviving like uh, our uh, air airport uh, or Rantoul Chinook Air Force Base Museum is closing out because it's just too hard to person it and to keep it afloat uh, and that's so for a lot of museums. So bicycling and people who are interested in museums and interested in finding out about places can keep these uh, resources afloat and uh, they're very helpful to the people who are riding bicycles, especially those that are interested. We have uh, Ragby in, in Iowa, which um, I've been there when Ragby went through and it was going through on Route 80 when I was there and, and there were little hot dog stands all the way along, the public was interested. There were the athletes that were going to uh, travel across Iowa at a uh, competitive speed. There were the people who were going to uh, run four little towns and uh, do a beer fest at the same time. There were people who just sort of got on and got off, uh, but it's rather famous and it works very well. Uh, so when I go to this sort of conferences, I'm thinking about local, but I'm looking at, at a broader issue. So one of some of my questions were, what are we doing about Route 80 across the country and 
and Route 6 and Route 66 uh, that sort of parallel and, and have all these interesting resources. And you'd be amazed what you can find when you walk around little places like uh, Prairie City and, and you see uh, Tiffany era buildings or, uh, and they need to be a little bit uh, uh, promoted. And there are still abandoned railroads and one was just coming out, so I, I want to report on that. Uh, uh, there were keynote addresses. Uh, the first keynote address was uh, by a guy named Dr. Douglas Gentile, and his speech was about children, and they have been watching children, uh, watching television, watching children that are monolithically interested in games, uh, watching children that don't get exercise, and they have been testing the, the various blocks of, of interest uh, to see how brains are working and how uh, things like SAT scores uh, uh, recorded and and it's perfectly obvious that the people who are w watching games, especially, are more aggressive, and their th their ability to think across the board is somewhat limited by their uh, type of interest in in gaming and, and often aggressive during game uh, games. Uh, so th that uh, talk silence quite a few people and I think the ones with children are going to look at their children slightly differently and to make sure that they get out into to the uh, boondocks. Later I'll say something about uh, home, home uh, uh, school children that were at a, a prairie center and uh, I just got the feeling that those young people from age one through about eight uh, were getting a, a, a very good education. Uh, the second keynote addresser was a, a guy who had spent time in and Champagne, and his name was Jay Wall Jasper, and he uh, wanted to say things about open space, uh, and he didn't feel like he was a specialist in trails, but. He was a, he's a very popular speaker because he did, he, where he lives he puts a, 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 a stoop outside his house and people sit on it. And that's counterpart to what we have just uh, outside weft. We have a, 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 a bench that many people sit on and watch uh, the window opposite with artifacts in it and then sometimes they get caught and taken over to the pocket prairie. And uh, So he was talking about those sorts of things, uh, things that make people excited. Uh, uh, the uh, area where you can skate, the, the somebody putting a, a glacial erratic on the corner, uh, looking at all the advertising signs. Uh, and he was uh, very much a fun person and he opened it to the public to say, what do you have in your area that is uh, like this? How, 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 how do you stimulate uh, local interest and local excitement and, and also uh, local health? Uh, the third uh, keynote address was a young woman and she and her uh, another woman had encountered a, a book written by Eric Severide which dealt with uh, going from uh, Minnesota to the Hudson Bay. Uh, Eric Severide had done this. It's a very hard thing to do because the water f for part of the, uh, the area from like uh, South Dakota's Red River goes south. Uh, well, perhaps it's the Red River that goes north, but one of the drainage systems goes south and one of them goes north. So if you're going to paddle 
upstream, you might be doing a uh, hundred yards in, a, in several hours. Uh, whereas if you're on the other side of the hill and you go down to the Hudson River, you might be doing rapids and uh, be moving very fast. Uh, so I, I forget how long it took them to do this, but uh, th they had lots of interactions with each other, with the, uh, the uh, areas where they portage around dams and things like that. Uh, they uh, had to deal with food. Uh, they had to deal with bears. Uh, people advised them to take on a dog, so they put a dog in their canoe, and uh, that was because there were bears. And she has come back and now runs a non-profit agency that, that brings together people in like types of experiences. Uh, uh, we had a field trip. And I chose to go on the field trip, which looked at the development of small communities associated with trails. Well, we went to a place called Perry, and uh, here I'm looking at what will happen. In, what about that meeting at St. Joe? Where will the restaurant go? Where will the bicycle shop go? Where will uh, there be a, an ambiance? Uh, so sometimes this is referred to economic development, but it's not really economic development. It's been far greater development than that. It's a development of mind, a development of friendship, uh, volunteerism, uh, an understanding of where the water is flowing and where the railroad went through it and node uh, so that uh, it wouldn't erode uh, so easily. Uh, there's uh, areas of prairie that are uh, wonderful prairies that have been mown to death and even herbicided. Uh, how do we uh, do this? Uh, one of the things to, that they recommend uh, a lot is for the local com communities to have something like uh, Carnegie Library, like at Deland, or uh, some manufacturing organization like uh, a big hog organization and people don't always know where their hogs come from. I would be game to say uh, could Tyson's put a, a field trip through their uh, facility so that people could know what a, uh, uh, what an abattoir's was like. Uh, there's a big bridge, a high bridge, and it's been uh, restored uh, for a trail with a sort of modern t type um, steel uh, expressions that are almost a sculpted piece to, that sort of keep the fences on either side together. I didn't go on that field trip, but I certainly heard a lot about that bridge. And it's in a, a, a nest of railroad beds that are uh, pretty interesting. Uh, one of the things in this case was a hotel, a hotel that uh, was of a different era. Uh, the, the young folks that bought it uh, have uh, used it to invite uh, business people in, but they also are concerned about bicycles uh, and what bicycles do and how they relate to the local history, historic museum. And uh, uh, on one end, they had a sales place. Uh, this is all wooden uh, paneling, and the sales shop was likewise. But that has been converted to a, a bicycle shop, keeping all the history right there. And, uh, so around the corner is a... Uh, trailhead, and it is also where they have their farmer's market. Uh, there are interesting things like a uh, an alleyway closed off with a huge sculpted piece that had plows and uh, steel of a history uh, so people could stand back and take photographs of it. And then around the corner again there was a uh, a library building that had closed out, 
and uh, two people had got game. Uh, they, they knew that the school board was going to sell this thing, and they didn't have any money, but they wrote a pr proposal for one dollar to buy the, the building, and uh, the board said yes. So they had taken this and made it into a, an art gallery. There's a upstairs area which is big enough for a large band and a dance floor that uh, I would give an eye to to have because it was like I grew up in Australia. Dance floors are very fast if you're, you're in the era of uh, dancing. So, uh, and uh, uh, in the basement was a whole bunch of art and a bar and, and uh, this uh, was something that where well, people were game to do something. So one of the s stories I see over and over is be game to dream and be game to implement and don't be afraid if it, if it doesn't work. Try lots of different things. So if the one thing doesn't work, then uh, try something different. Sometimes you have to work with volunteers who get co very committed. If they've been working on this sort of thing for 25 years, they are committed to sometimes to an idea. And, uh, uh, and sometimes it's known that that sort of idea it doesn't work elsewhere. So uh, could, uh, so then you have the diplomatic problem of, of having to, to either uh, change the thought pattern or uh, perhaps even uh, uh, ask the volunteer to retire for a few years and come back again. And that sort of thing has even happened at West where you have volunteers that get overly inspired and, and then don't quite fit into the overall pattern of things. And so you have to have uh, board details that deal with this. So some of the meetings that I went to were dealing with these sorts of pro pro problems. But uh, that trip was probably about 20, 30 miles away from downtown uh, Des Moines. And, but the roadsides had native plants on them and I give the credit to uh, Daryl Smith who runs a prairie system at uh, Northern Iowa University and he has convinced the university to put prairies in in many places. Uh, I was traveling with a, a woman who is at the visitor center and, and uh, so they had a lot of debate at one stage about the plants that were outside the visitor center and eventually the plants were removed because they were quite close to the building and they were afraid to burn. They might burn down the building that we know People like Pat Armstrong in uh, uh, one of the Chicago suburbs where she burns to within six inches of a frame house. Mm -hmm. But she knows how to burn. And so uh, Daryl Smith has a uh, uh, laboratory, a uh, grad students, probably about 12 grad students, and they hold the archives for the North American Prairie Conference which, just to remind you folk out there, that the next North American Prairie Biennial Conference will be at Bloomington, right in your back door. And uh, uh, you should make sure that you're there. Uh, it, they're, they're very helpful conferences. Uh, and they're, they're only been in action for about 20, uh, biennial periods, so that means about 40 years. So uh, before that, we didn't have groups like Grand Prairie Friends or, or docent groups or, or uh, groups out there that belong to small communities, and we need them. Uh, so I stayed over on, on the, uh, for an after-conference meeting of people. It was a workshop on fundraising and uh, organizations. And one of the things that I get is, uh, if you have a trail, work on it fairly immediately. Don't leave it sit, Let, well, like we've done with Heartland Pathways. 
well, not totally. We've got two miles of, of rail bed at Monticello and we've got natural area four miles to Cisco. And, but the only area between... Uh, uh, we've also saved Shady Rest, so we've been at it, but it's a long, slow process, and that was uh, stressed over and over. This sort of rail development goes into a number of generations. It's never finished. There is never really one idea which is going to work. Sometimes it works. The, the, the uh, Katy Trail between St. Louis and uh, Kansas City had a buyer who bought the railroad bed. And now they've been extending into Kansas City. They've been extending it across the river in Illinois. Uh, but getting it started is the thing. Even if it's only 10 feet and you have a plan, have a plan that is a plan for an engineer, that, which is 200 pages, but more likely have a plan for uh, 100 yards uh, and show the sort of thing you can do. What are you going to do with the trees that are weed trees on the side? What do you do with the prairie? What, what do you do with the bicycles? Where can they meet? Where can they... Uh, contribute their energy. Uh, so uh, that sometimes is very time consuming. You've got to teach volunteers what it is that they could do. And uh, you have to know the personality. You've got to develop a, a rapport that, uh, uh, so you're trusted as, as a, an administrator. Uh, sometimes an administrator is a key. Sometimes the uh, the administrator is very clever to work with committees and groups, and that is a talent that is needed. Often it is said, don't be so worried about your board. Be worried about the people that you can have as advisors, because advisors can come in and do something. If you want an accountant, you may be able to get an accountant for a key presentation to IRS, and then that re accountant can retreat for a while until he's needed again. So advisory boards are encouraged. And uh, uh, then there are the people who watch you from a distance. <laughs> and it's sort of amazing that uh, people uh, don't always involve themselves in, for instance, a trail in uh, Monticello. They have a, a new library going to go up because somebody put in $2 million. Uh, the the Katy Trail guy put in lots more than that for, for a 200 mile of trail. Uh, so, so you need to be public. That means you have to, it's more important sometimes to hire a specialist in fundraising than it is to be constantly trying to make the board regulations perfect because they will never be perfect and they're always dynamic and they're always changing. Uh, the board is responsible but they need to hire people who can have skills in social work, rural sociology. Uh, they have to be fairly buoyant uh, and they have to know how to relate to the historic museum or the, or the sculpted piece or the five and dime store and whatnot. So uh, I ask questions about uh, who you ask for grant money because sometimes the people who give grant money also are the people who are beside the world. And I'm not very excited about accepting uh, money from them. And I say, so. The answer I got was, tainted money is tainted money, but it tainted enough, mm. which means I was a little disappointed with that sort of comment because uh, it means that uh, people are prepared to m take the money that is donated, but often that money comes without any uh, congressional consideration, without any federal or state involvement, and it sometimes uh, shortcuts uh, IRS by dropping the uh, income level and uh, 
going to a, a lower income bracket. So there's a, a common sense to donating. Uh, but sometimes we have to think about the nature of t tainted money. It, uh, uh, there's, there's also a whole bunch of young people, and they think about uh, flash uh, attendance. There's a, a problem here. We, bicycles can't get across this road here, and the county board has uh, said they don't want to change. So a thousand people arrive on the, state st the situation and make a statement. It's called a flash move. And uh, so uh, they all put in five dollars. And uh, so do you do a kickstart? Well, kickstarts go, but apparently kickstarts don't, don't really get you there. Uh, it's, it's the five dollar level, uh, and it's many of it, and you can do certain things with that. But basically the people who are thinking about trails and funding them are from, 40, from uh, the 50s up. They're, they're thinking about it. So you, you need to, to tell people who are uh, aged, who are uh, thinking about what they do with their money. Uh, you can't go out and knock on the door and say, hey, do you want to put in a thousand dollars? You have to tell these people what the heck you're doing uh, and uh, give them a chance to ride the line, and it's amazing that some of the older people who've never been on a bicycle get onto a bicycle, and they think about the vegetation on either side, and they think about the people, and, and then there are other little stories that you, you need to listen. So I, I, was, I didn't stay at the, the hotel. Uh, uh, the, the, the price for the conference hotel was $139, and I didn't have that sort of money. And uh, I went to a Motel 6, which was six miles away. It was, there are, there's a spaghetti of super expressways, and you don't always know which way to go. So west, you may have to go east to go west and this sort of thing. So a, a very friendly soul named Thompson uh, took me to Motel 6, and, and I there and afterwards knew how to get onto Martin Luther's drive and get into the hotel, the uh, conference hotel. Uh, but as we were talking, uh, he is a, uh, a, he and his wife are both interested in uh, people who are uh, disabled or unable to attend school. So one of his jobs was as a home instructor. And he told me this little story, which uh, is the sort of thing you need to keep in your mind and, and it makes uh, for understanding. He, he visited a, a home where the, the, the student ha, had, had a problem and his legs were extended up in the air and he was in a, a bed and his grandmother looked after him. But he, he uh, the guy, uh, Thompson that was talking to me couldn't quite find the house, so Grandma came out, and uh, so he found the. But Grandma forgot to bring the key out, and she locked the door. So he had to crawl through the window over the top of the patient, and and then let Grandma in the house. But it's little stories that that make for interest. And, uh, so there was an engineer from a concrete expert, spent six years getting his degrees in, in Champagne, uh, Champagne and Manor. Uh, the, uh, there weren't quite as many Champagne and Manor people there as I thought there might be. And, uh, but there's certainly interest. I was going back to St. Joe. There are uh, two culverts that have been removed by farmers nearby that I mean, two or three but uh, these culverts uh, ostensibly let the water through um, more easily if the, the pipe is removed and you have a broad what is called a M Missouri cut uh, but I was standing next to uh, a trail CEO who was complaining that he had one of these and he wanted to know from the engineer who was exhibiting what it would cost to bridge those 
Uh, and you can quite easily spend the best part of a million dollars replacing the culvert was taken out. So that sort of discussion would go on and continues to go on in places like St. Joe. Uh, we have to uh, try and institute no more policies. Uh, uh, and, and so locally we have a, a, a number of places where we're on old roads and we uh, they can be uh, dangerous in that they can people can move fast on them, but if you put a shared road and people understand that this is also a bicycle way, uh, you can do interesting things between Danville and Decatur and Clinton and Monticello and Allen Park and Cisco. Uh, so I was very pleased, a little bit excited moving faster than I should do. So I tripped over <laughs> just a few moments ago, and you can see that probably on my face. Uh, but uh, uh, I want to now take another day off and, and go to some of these communities. So there is Colfax, 22 miles out of, of uh, downtown Des Moines. And then there's Prairie City, and then there's an 8,000 acre prairie with a learning center. So, uh, and then there's a railroad museum. So I was moving along these corridors. In some cases, at uh, Prairie City, they're going to put back a trail. Uh, the railroad line has only just come out. But when you get to Monroe, uh, a little further east, the railroad was taken out a number of years ago, and you can see the uh, stanchions or the towers that handle uh, electricity are sitting out in the middle of nowhere where the railroad line right away it was. Or, uh, and uh, it, that has been resumed by farming. So uh, we'll put a few photographs of these sorts of things in so you, you can see what we mean. Uh, at Colfax, uh, I had visited early in the morning when I went through the first time just to see uh, if some of the things I thought might be there were there, and that was rather positive. And early in the morning, so you get a different light. But when I came back, I came back uh, late at night, and so uh, I waited till the morning, and uh, I, well, I was early enough in the night to, to visit some of the historic spots. Uh, how do I know about uh, Colfax? Well, Colleen Anspark was a local professor of fashion, and she lived in the same building as uh, I did. And we uh, uh, sometimes visited uh, Colfax. Colfax, uh, early on, was a mining town. So you have the history of little skiffs that moved uh, coal. You had pit ponies that were blind because they were always underground. You had farmers that had five acre lots that provided uh, alfalfa uh, or hay for the pit ponies and water and things like that. Uh, so there's, there's an old history there. But you have to think about the, the plate tectonics and how the world has moved and why do we have coal here in the first place and why do we have mineral springs? Uh, and there's a hill, and on top of the hill is a palace for people who would visit from Chicago or New York and in a very affluent uh, position, but they had arthritis, and minerals were thought to uh, save arthritis. Uh, some of this mineral water was actually shipped to Grover Cleveland, uh, who was president at the time. Uh, that was the theory that this would help, and probably warm water and minerals did help some, but not a lot. When it came to the Depression era, there wasn't the money to do this. And so the, the uh, mineral era uh, fell off. But while it was active between about 1905 and about 1928, it, it was very active. And uh, the, the Palace on the top of the hill was counterparted with hotels on the main street and 
and more or less dormitories where people could stay. Uh, Carleen's Ansbach's family got into the act where they grew up at Ida Grove, which is a sort of central Iowa, and on a farmland. And so father eventually became a doctor uh, and uh, selected to go to Colfax to look after the people who were uh, getting mineral water attention. But it was so popular that there was an interurban 22 miles from Des Moines so that people could come in on a special railroad to attend. And there was a, a local interurban that ran by the hour up and down the hill to, to, to the palace. The palace is still there. It's now a, a place for a t teen challenge. Uh, but in its day, after it closed uh, the first time, it was a hog palace. It, uh, uh, people who bred hogs would keep the hogs there, and there was an elevator, so they would bring the hogs up to auction, uh, probably in what was the dining room. Uh, that era stopped, but the Teen Challenge has taken over, and uh, part of the old building has been taken down, but it's still a four-story building. And uh, I, I stopped and asked people, and yes, they told me where it was. And, and I asked a gentleman at the Five and Dime store, uh, oh yes, he knew Carlene, and he used to work for Carlene in her garden. She would be in Champagne for most of the year, but uh, sometimes she'd go back to Colfax. And she had two brothers, and the two brothers became doctors. Uh, one stayed in Colfax, so this gentleman had uh, one of the Ansbachs as his doctor. Ansbach Jr. was his doctor, and then eventually he has passed on. The other doctor was a, a radiologist, and uh, he was in Chicago. But Colleen uh, was, uh, grew up with her brothers, and uh, she was also going to be uh, utilizing the academic world. So she went to the University of Chicago and got a PhD in economics and then came to the University of Illinois as a professor of fashion and then she retired back to Colfax. She was determined before she passed and she's already passed. Uh, she would put, uh, do a lot to help uh, Colfax. She put lights in the streets. She, she uh, has put up a huge museum for the era of coal and, and uh, minerals. And she bought uh, a little street load of artifacts that is uh, labeled Carleen Ansbach Boulevard. Uh, she found that there are plastic buffalo around, so there are a couple of plastic buffalo out in the middle of a, what is a sand prairie. I've had to visit this sort of because she wanted to know what she could do with the building, what she could do with the artifacts. And I always wondered where she, uh, in her house, which was up on the hill that uh, her father had built before he had children. And it was a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a, a bungalow a bungalow at our house, and they had a, a 1956 uh, Lincoln, which uh, had some of those long projections out the back, uh, and I'd driven it around with, with Carly, and she, would, she kept this in. So I went to the house, and I uh, checked out the, the person who's bought it. That there is, that he and his wife are both in English language. Uh, uh, teaching at various colleges, and uh, uh, right down the hill is is a uh, an amphitheater, and so Carleen had a lot to do with restoring that amphitheater. And uh, the 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 guy who owns the house just above is is interested in historic preservation, so he had things to tell me. And a next door neighbor was uh, part of the. Newton in Jasper County, uh, Colfax is in Jasper County, and he knew all about the interurbans and things like that. He was off to a high school football game that I'd noted 
up on the hill. <laughs> These little things go on. I, when I went to Prairie City later, there was, there, uh, oh no, it was a little bit near Mount Pleasant. There was a Halloween people were there. So you, you sort of merge into the, the local scenery. I still got a few minutes left. Uh, so so uh, after I'd talked to the, the gentleman at the dime store, I found out that he got, had to go and bought, bury a horse. And why did he have to bury a horse? Well, it was a teenage horse and it was a friend of the family. But his father had been working with uh, a, a farm of horses that had his, uh, 60 horses and they were breeding horses, probably sulky horses or buggy horses and draft horses, mainly for the Amish communities. Uh, so we talked about horses for a little while and uh, he went off to, to bury the family pet. Uh, just another one of the little stories that make things interesting. Uh, I took off for Prairie City. Uh, Prairie City is a very small city <laughs> and it's got a square. And so I did t talk to the, to the friendly uh, dime store person and she pointed out where the city b building was. So I went to the city building to see if this railroad line was going through Prairie City uh, was or could be a, a rail trail. And the answer was yes, and they're working at it with the uh, Iowa Department of Transportation and the Department of Natural Resources. So that's good. And just around the corner is this uh, 6,000 acre, but possibly even 8,000 acre prairie with a herd of buffalo. I didn't get to see the buffalo because they were feeding on grass that was a little more attractive out of the way, but uh, you travel along roads that uh, you're warned that buffalo are wild animals and <laughs> don't mess with them because you might just lose out. And the buffalo are keep, kept in uh, fenced, the, the area is fenced, and there's a rumble strip where you, you, cattle will not go over uh, the, the rumble strip because it's like uh, railroad lines. Uh, uh, so if they put their hoof in, they fall through and they break themselves. So they, they don't do that. They're cunning enough to know. Uh, but I went to the visitor center. I was very honored to be there when there were the uh, homeschool crew of young one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, and many of the mothers were already pregnant with another child. So uh, they were in this six million dollar museum and you could walk down and and look up at the roots of the prairie plants and see the animals in there. You could see prairie chickens. You could, uh, and I encountered a, a gentleman who has, uh, before him, a, a lady who is very helpful. I, I uh, realized that some of the books that were there were, were specialized books that we don't have access to easily. And the elder gentleman came in as a volunteer and he knew me because he'd bought one of our Grow It, Don't Mow It t-shirts uh, at a prairie conference. Uh, and uh, he helped me to, uh, was, I didn't have time to review all these books, but he could tell me the people, and some of the people I know, so I do know the books. But And we brought some of those back, and actually uh, some of those got bought by uh, uh, Jill and uh, Tony at Cisco when we were there last night. So. <laughs> we, uh, so yes, uh, I was looking at that because small elements of this could be what you have in St. Joe or, or Fithian or other places, Heartland Pathways for instance. Uh, that's why we did battle to keep a pepsin factory, because it had history. Uh, then I went off to uh, Mount Pleasant where there's a railroad museum and we have to deal with the railroad museum that is, occupies seven miles of the same rail bed that we've bought for, uh, uh, abandoned for Prairie. And uh, there was two neat engines that I took photographs of. And, uh, then I came home and that was wonderful. I'm, I'm still excited and, and uh, just because I was a bit over excited I tripped this morning and, and uh, smashed my face. But, uh, it's still good, and uh, 
uh, I'll remember that conference for a long time and uh, utilize some of its advice. And I think we're near the end. This is Dave Monk, your Prairie Monk, WEFT Champagne, 90.1 on your FM dial. And And Dave on the board. And as always, the views expressed are solely those of the speakers and no one else.